Mr. Culp, everybody ready to go? Yes, I suppose. How are All you? Right. We're we're ready to go here. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm right. gonna I'm gonna go live, and then, right. uh, we'll uh, once you see the video pop up and start playing, that's when uh, we started the program. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's gonna be just another minute or so. All right. A day to remember for the rest of your lives. There's a great promise for all of you. The Pro Football Hall of Fame and Extreme Networks present the Heart of a Hall of Famer program. With nearly 100 Hall of Famers participating, we have reached 48 states around this country, sharing the message that football is more than a game and can teach Americans how to huddle up during a time when we need to be united. It's time for America to take a real deep dive. Not at no one else, but at yourself individually. If you want to change America, don't brush your teeth with your head down. Look at who you are and be the example. Be the example. An opportunity to meet and learn from one of the greatest football players of all time. But more than that, the chance to see that their Hall of Fame life wasn't given to them. Single parent homes, drug infested neighborhoods, and poverty. I grew up in a neighborhood that was considered one of the worst in America. And the household I grew up in was one of the worst in that neighborhood. By the time I was 20 years old, I knew at least 30 friends or family members who had lost their lives. Football became like a second parent to me. It taught me the things that my father wasn't there to teach me and that my mother as a struggling single parent woman just didn't know to teach me. But they learn how to live a life of character before pursuing their football careers. Today, you will learn you can do the same that they once did. Making good decisions can lead to a prosperous life both on and off the field. Your game for life has already begun it's your decision whether or not you want to be a successful student, son, daughter, brother, or sister. Every one of you can have a Hall of Fame life whether or not you play football. You can be as great as you want to be. The Hall of Fame is all about integrity, character, and excellence. You have the opportunity to represent yourself that way. You determine your character. Welcome to a once-in-a-lifetime program, the heart of a Hall of Famer. I am just overwhelmed by the struggles, joys, and tears of those who have made it here. 
and I am proud to join this elite group of men and pleased to pass the torch on to future Hall of Famers. Hopefully our stories, preserved forever in the Hall of Fame, will remind us and demonstrate to others what hard work and teamwork can produce. I just want to thank everyone whom I've worked with over the years. Each one has a very special place in my heart, and I will always remember this time in my life with continued pleasure. It is an honor for me to be placed among all these great Hall of Famers, and just it was an honor to wear the red and white of the Kansas City Chiefs and the blue and white of the Houston Oilers. I am now honored and humbled to wear Hall of Fame Go! To all, um, to all future athletes, keep training, keep connecting with the community, and keep all of those here on this stage tonight in your prayers. And again, thank you so much for this honor. Good evening. All right, and with that, I'd like to welcome you to our last installment of 2018 for our Heart of a Hall of Famer program. My name is Jake. I work here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in our Youth and Education Department. I'm going to be moderating uh, this session today. I'm live here in Canton, Ohio, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And today we're going to feature Hall of Famer and Gold Jacket, Mr. Curly Culp, who's coming to us live from Maynard High School in Maynard, Texas. Our mission here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence everywhere. And those values we promote of those are commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. Uh, I'm excited today, and hopefully all those students tuning in, all of our folks tuning in via Facebook Live, are excited to learn how those values made Mr. Culp the man he is today, not only the guy who wears the gold jacket, uh, but the guy off the field as well. But before we get started, I do have some thank yous uh, I want to send out. First and foremost, I want to thank our partners at Extreme Networks. Without, without their help, uh, this program wouldn't be able to happen. They do so much for us here at the Hall of Fame and so much for schools all throughout the country. i also like to thank our teachers and administrators for allowing us today to come into the classroom uh, right here close to the holiday uh, break and, uh, and talk to those students about the Hall of Fame and what it means to be a Hall of Famer and the values the game of football teaches. Lastly, though, and, and probably most importantly, I'd like to thank our students. Uh, without you today, this program doesn't happen. Um, you guys are going to be one asking the questions. It's not every day you get to talk to one of the best football players to ever step on a football field. So make sure we're, we're listening, we're asking questions today, and hopefully we walk away learning something valuable we can use in the rest of our lives. So with that, I want to turn things over uh, to our Hall of Famer, Gold Jack, and one of the greatest players to ever play the game, one of the greatest men to ever play the game, Hall of Famer, Mr. Curly Culp. Good morning. I, it's certainly a pleasure, an honor for me to be here this morning to talk to you about uh, the topic I think some of you have had an opportunity to look at, which is character. And uh, I'd also I'd be able to answer some questions, especially those questions that are personal in nature that uh, were uh, helpful in me becoming a Hall of Famer. As they talked about, the Hall, the Hall of Fame, being an advocate, an ambassador to the Hall of Fame, there are certain values that we advocate. Those values being commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. And as, as a young man, when I was in high school, some two decades ago, in fact, 1964, when I started high school, correction. 19, was it 1960? No, 1960. And I finished in 1964 and then going on and, and playing uh, football at Arizona State University. And when I think about character, the two things that comes to mind is mental and moral qualities that are distinctive to you and only to you. And those, and those qualities will help you as, you as you grow and develop in any, any, chosen, any chosen field that you that you care to pursue. And so those things are, are, are guiding principles for me. I think athletics are, is one that allows you to, to grow, grow physically and grow mentally. I know that when I first started playing that some of the things that were very helpful for me is just the work ethic. 
you know, you have to work hard and you're going and you have to sacrifice. And if you're willing to, to sacrifice and work hard, then good things will happen. And you have to set your goals. You have goal setting opportunities. When you set your goals, you meet one goal and you set another goal. And as you grow in your goal setting, you become better at what you're doing. And those are the kind of things that athletics has taught me, not only uh, in the, on the football field, but also in the classroom. I know when I was going, going up in, at Yuma High School, we had a situation there that uh, if, in order to play football on game day, you had to make sure you were eligible during the week and so you had to pass those classes. So there was a real connection between athletics and academics. And I really, I really enjoyed that combination because growing up, my parents, uh, both of them didn't have an eighth grade education. I had a lot of responsibilities early on. Um, my father was laid off from the, from the Southern Pacific Railroad. And so we, he got involved in janitorial work. So we had businesses that we had to clean up in the morning prior to me going to school. Also, uh, there was chores after school we had a little farm, we raised hogs, and I know you may have heard the stories about the 50 pound barrels that I threw around to gain some strength and I, and I, when I was growing up. And those kind of things were very helpful to me to guide me to be the person I am today. And so I'm very thankful for that. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may, that may want to, to ask me, and I'll be frank with you. If I can't answer it, I'll tell you I can't answer it. But I, I think it's a very important that I share share that piece of information. And becoming a, a gold jacket recipient is very a great honor for me. I, when, coming out and when I started playing football, it wasn't my real goal to end up being a Hall of Famer. My goal was to be the best person that I could be in anything that I was participating in, in the classroom or on the athletic field. And I, and I, did, I did both pretty well. In fact, uh, in high school, I was on honor roll a few times. I, I graduated to 29 in my, in my graduating class. And I, I also participated in wrestling. Wrestling is a great sport. And that's a sport in where, I don't know if many of you know anything about wrestling, but wrestling, it, you know, you have to use leverage and, and quickness. And those, those two uh, characteristics specifically enabled me to be a better football player on the field. And so I'm very thankful for that experience uh, there at Yuma High School. So with this, I, oh, I would open up the, uh, the floor for questions. Be free to ask those questions that, that come to mind. And don't, don't think that they might be silly questions, but they're personal to you, and I'll be more than happy to ask them for you. Uh, describe what it was like being drafted into the NFL, and how did the team go for you? Again, please. Describe how it was being drafted into the NFL how did the team notify you? Okay. How did I feel? It was a great feeling. Um, I was at um, Arizona State University. I was, uh, just came from practice because I was wrestling. I was in two sports, Arizona State, football and wrestling. I was in my, in my dorm room, and I got a call from Denver Broncos telling me that I was, I was drafted. I was excited about it, but I, I, I think I was more excited about the fact that I was competing that week against a guy that was pretty good in wrestling. I, it was kind of a, a twofold thing and that, that I, the, the importance of it all. But I, I looked at it from the standpoint of that I was, I was blessed because I, I was able to get drafted. And I knew that that draft date was, was significant of me being able to do something other than, other than, you know, if I was going into business and whatever, it was an opportunity to play football. And so I was really looking forward to that experience. Hey, so Mr. Colby, talk a little bit about being a, being a wrestler and being a two-sport athlete there at Arizona State. Um, how did uh, playing two sports or even being a wrestler help you become a, a better football player? Well, as I stated earlier, wrestling is, is a sport in which quickness and leverage is very important to be successful on the mat. And those, those same skills are transferable nicely to the game of football with interior line play. I was a defensive lineman oftentimes uh, because of my stature. I was a little shorter than, than most of my – competition so I could get up under and get that those pad level up underneath under those pads and use that leverage and quickness to my advantage. So I think we, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the year uh, 1967. Can you tell the students there in front of you what was special about that year for you, especially uh, being a wrestler there at Arizona State? That's a, that was a great year for me in 1967. I had a coach by the name of Ted Bradyhoff. God bless his soul. He's no longer here with us, but he's here in spirit. Um, 
he got me into the best shape of my, my entire life. I was about 265 pounds, 6'1", and I was, I was really strong. My endurance was good, and he, he kept me to my top physical condition. And I even dreamed about the Nationals that year in my dorm room. I dreamed that I would go to the Nationals, believe it or not, and that I would win. Uh, the first guy that I, that I wrestled uh, from, uh, I believe that guy was from Lehigh, and I wanted to check my endurance. So I beat this guy 15 to five. And, I, and then I knew I, you know, we, we wrestled three periods, so I knew my condition was pretty good. And, I, and if I had to go to three periods, I would be okay. And so from that point on, I, um, I was able to pin the rest of my opponents. Even in the, in the championship round, a guy by the name of Nick Carollo, I was fortunate enough to pin him in a, in a short period of time. And so I was very, very blessed to have a great coach, uh, great to have uh, athletes in the, in the wrestling room, guys like Charlie Tribble, guys like Russ Warner, these individuals helped that, that were, had international competition. And so they came in and worked out with me and to make me a better athlete. And I'm very thankful for that. All right, we'll turn it back over to some students there, Maynard, for the next question. How did football help you persevere through tough moments in your life? Well, I think you asked me a question concerning um, adversity. Um, and I knew you're a football player. We talked briefly earlier. And in, in football, you're going to have those times when you might get beat. You know, if you're an offensive lineman, you have a defensive lineman that beats you. And so what are you going to do? What are you going to do to combat his, his strong points? So that, so that makes you dig a little deeper within, maybe address some of the skills that you've been able to to learn from, from film study and what things he likes to do uh, from a defensive perspective and to, to go beyond that. Personally, I think uh, when I think of courage, I think of true grit, I think of being able to play with pain. There is a difference between pain and injury. I think in the National Football League, even in college, uh, college and high school sports, I think sometimes as the year grows, you know, you get you get the soreness, you get the stiffness, you don't feel as energetic as you might be the week before. And so you have to, you have to learn to, to work through that pain, to go beyond that pain in order to help the team win a contest. So those kind of things are very important. Uh, do we have another student there uh, who has a question? I have a question. Not necessarily a student, uh, Professor Baby, the principal, but one question I do have for you because um, I know when we think about football, a lot of times it's identified um, – for the male gender sport. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some young ladies and some women who still play, but the majority is males. Okay. Um, I know in this setting we have a group of young ladies with us. What message could you share with these young ladies um, in terms of the skill set and the things that they can take from the sport itself, but would help them to, to continue to thrive in life and reach their goals? I think regardless of the, of the sex of the individual, athletics plays a, a great part for, for development develop mental development as well as moral development. Uh, because if you're gonna be great at what you're doing, you have to put the time in. You have to do the reps, you got to practice, you got to get into training. And, and all those things are necessary to succeed. And what those things does, is it builds character. You know, I know we talk about character, it builds character. In other words, it, it helps you to become better at what you're doing. And the more you do it, the more you hone your skills, the better you become. And I think that's transferred into other things in life, whatever you want to do in life. And I think it, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have that competition, I believe. Mr. Kopp, you stole the words right out of my mouth. I was just going to get ready to say uh, how those values we talk about at those beginning, commitment, integrity, courage, uh, respect, and excellence all are universal. And it doesn't matter what sport you play or even if you play sports at all, those five values are going to be help you become better uh, outside of whatever you'd like to do. So uh, I, that was a great question. Um, we're going to kind of transition into that. Out of those five values you think not only that football teach, but you can learn from sports, out of those five that we believe in here the most at the Hall of Fame, what do you, uh, which one do you think is the most important? Uh, well, when you talk about commitment, integrity, respect, excellence, I think um, first you've got to be committed. You've got to be dedicated to what you're doing. And so I think commitment is, is, is right, really at the right place, the top of the, the value list. So you got to be committed. And then uh, I think uh, possibly courage, because in regards to what you do in life, you're going you're gonna to come, you're going to have bumps in the road. And how do you deal with those bumps in the road? 
uh, would determine how you, whether or not you succeed in that. So that's very important. And then the, the last one of the, of, the, of the value we talked about, excellence. Excellence in being the best that you can, that you can possibly be. And so I think those three, not, not was, notwithstanding the other two, very important respect and, and integrity, but I think those, those three, uh, commitment, courage, and excellence would be my top three. All right, we'll send it back there to those students in front of you for another question. Yes. When I was fortunate enough to have football, I, I started a business, a um, pest control business. I did that for several years in the Houston area. I sold that business and then came to Austin to work on a postgraduate degree here in Austin and, and got involved in the transportation business. I did that for a few years and then I retired from all of that in about the early, early uh, 2012 or something of that nature. You talk a little bit about the, the, the transition there from the game of football to life off the field. Uh, you talked a little bit about how, you know, you jumped right in, had a business. Is there, what did you miss most about the game of football after you retired? The camaraderie, uh, the, um, the teamwork, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's kind of hard to explain the unity that you feel in that locker room. You know, you got, you got brothers you, and you're all working for a common goal. And, and you and you are you connected and those experiences are with you for a lifetime all right uh, we'll go to another student there at Maynard with a question when did you know it was time to step away when did I know well we always want to <laughs> in athletics well I, I you know I wanted to play as long as you as you can and you're able to play and so I was very fortunate I had an opportunity to play for 14 years I started out in Denver. In fact, I was, I was Denver Broncos. Uh, actually, theoretically, the first draft choice, first guy picked in the second round for the Denver Broncos. And there I we had a coach by the name of Sid Gilman. And Sid Gilman wanted me to be an offensive guard. And I think the main reason they wanted me to be an offensive guard is because when I was at Arizona State, the majority of my, my activities were actually was defense. I never played uh, anything offensively. Except my first freshman, I think I, play, I blocked for Reggie Jackson a couple of plays in, in, in the summer. I mean, in, in freshman ball. But uh, because of my stature, my height, and because I think my experience in wrestling, they felt that I would be ideal offensive guard material in professional football. But I felt different. I, I felt that my, my uh, drive and my desire was to be a defensive ball player. And he did give me an opportunity to play defense, I think, the last, the last uh, preseason game. And I scored best of all defensive linemen. But unfortunately, I guess it wasn't enough to sway him. And he, and he traded me to Kansas City. And even in Kansas City with Hank Stram and, and those, uh, all the talent that we had there, I still started out at offensive guard. I was, as a rookie, you go wherever they need you. Most of the time, you're on special teams. And, and you go offense, you go defense. But primarily, you, got, you kind of fit in where you, you, know, where you can get in, basically. You know? and, but after my, my first year, I, they had a – a situation to develop a guy by the name of uh, Ernie Ladd. You, ever, you guys probably never heard of Ernie Ladd. He played in San Diego for many years. And Ernie Ladd was finishing his career in, in Kansas City. And that year, uh, he decided to retire and give up football. So that position that he was playing, which was left, left tackle, was open. And so I had an opportunity to compete, being a guy by the name of Ed Lothamer. Uh, and so the, uh, Hank Stram said, well, in training camp, preseason games, Whoever scored the best during the preseason games would have an opportunity to lock down that position. And I was able to do that. And so that's how, I thought how it all began there in Kansas City. Uh, we got a question coming in here from uh, our Facebook Live. Of, uh, Brandon's asking, uh, what do you consider the number one characteristic of being a Hall of Famer? And do you have any advice for, for future members or this class of 2019 who will be inducted here in a few short months? Ask me that question one more time. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think the, is the most important characteristic of being a Hall of Famer? And do you have any advice for that, for that new class that will be announced here in a, in a few months? Well, I don't I, I think uh, being, a, being a Hall of Famer is, is when I put on this go Jack, or just being in this elite group of men that, that played the game of football, it's, it's a great feeling. It's kind of hard to – to express in words, but it's very humbling knowing that they selected me 
out of all the other athletes out there that's playing professional football, I was chosen. So I feel proud and very humbled by that. And to answer your question about what advice I give to the other Hall of Famers, just to, you know, do what you've been doing. Because uh, – and to get consideration to become a member of this group, you must be doing something right. Now, obviously, a Hall of Famer, and we'll learn here in a little bit just kind of what that means to be a Hall of Famer. Um, was reading some articles uh, before we started today, and I saw, I saw this quote, and it kind of stuck, stuck out to me. It said, Curly Culp revolutionized the nose tackle position. Uh, as a player and now as a Hall of Famer, what does, what does that quote, and when you hear that, what does that mean to you? Well, it means that I played the game well. I, I was a, a, role, a role model. With that position, playing the nose tackle, they didn't they didn't talk about all that all that whooping that they put on me. They playing nose tackle, you know, <laughs> you know, you playing nose over the center, you got to deal with the center and the two guards. So you're constantly in battle. You, you never you never can you never can take a day rest, you know. You're always in in the battle, and so it's a great it's a great honor to be uh, to be respected and to to receive that kind of recognition for the for, for the game that I play. All right, we'll turn it back over there for another student question. You, Mr. Coach, and uh, this is more football based. Um, you as being a defensive lineman, I was an offensive lineman in college, and I always teach my guys as my football players when you're going, you know, position versus position, whether it's O line, D line, or wide receiver versus DBs. I always try to teach them about situations in the game within the game. Mm -hmm. but you know about all about that. There's there's several <laughs> battles within the trenches throughout an entire course of the game. Um, so as a defensive lineman. Uh, can you tell us some kind of, uh, I guess, maybe some something about what type of offensive lineman gave you the most trouble? And is there any one battle that you can remember that was just you really, really had to dig deep, you know? Yeah, I understand. The um, It's um, trying to reflect back on uh, when I played with Kansas City, um, the uh, Oakland Raiders and uh, San Diego was the teams that, always were up there in the division we had to, to deal with them in order to win the division. And when I think about the players that played on both of those teams in San Diego, there was a guy by the name of Walt Sweeney. He wasn't, he wasn't the strongest of, of offensive linemen, but he was very, he was very skillful in his technique. And so I had to really, really watch him closely in film study to, to determine what would be the best way to attack him. And in, and in uh, at Kansas city, that we uh, had our battles with Oakland Raiders. And with Oakland Raiders, you had guys like um, uh, Gene Upshaw, Art Shell. But I think on my side, I the guy named primarily was uh, um, Darby, I believe, was, was the center, and also uh, Jim Otto. Jim Otto was very strong, very very, uh, very good in what he tried to do. And then when I played in, in uh, Houston, we had those battles with Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, we had a guy that played center by the name Mike Webster. He was very strong, and he's, he's very, um, very good in what he tried to do. And so the thing that, that helped me throughout my career is, is, is try to um, watch the films and watch the film from a situational standpoint, from a formation standpoint, from down and distant tendency, so you kind of have an idea of what they're going to try to do to you, and you try to act accordingly when the ball is snapped. So just in that, in that quick uh, quote there, you mentioned probably three or four other Hall of Famers. So uh, it goes to show at the time you were playing, there were many, many great uh, athletes playing the game of football. And like you, like you said, uh, many of them were Hall of Famers. Um, we talk about being a Hall of Famer, and everybody knows it's a huge honor, a great honor to get that gold jacket. But to kind of put things in perspective, um, when you were inducted in 2003, uh, or 2013, excuse me, 2013, uh, you got three iconic pieces. You got that Haggard gold jacket that you're wearing, the K Jewelers Ring of Excellence, and then you get probably what everybody knows the most is that bronze bust uh, that goes on display here in Canton, Ohio, and will last for over 40,000 years. So uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to send it live to our Hall of Fame gallery with Jerry Shockey, who's the director of youth and education here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he's going to talk a little bit about what it means to get that bronze bust. So, Jerry, are you there? Yes, I am, Jake. Thank you very much. And, and students in uh, Manor, Texas, and, and Mr. Culp, we appreciate you guys connected into the, to the Hall of Fame gallery here. I'm joined by the bronze bust of Curly Culp. And, and just to give you guys an idea of just how big of an honor it is to be enshrined here in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, think about this for just a second. There have been 300 million people 
that have played the game of football at all levels throughout its history. Uh, there have been about 5 million that have played on the college level, and there have been about 29,000 that have been paid to play, coach, officiate, or administrate the game of football. Uh, but there are only 318 members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and Mr. Culp being one of those. Uh, Curly Culp, an All-American in football and wrestling at Arizona State, was selected in the second round of the 1968 draft by the Denver Broncos. The team attempted to switch him to guard on offense, and when the experiment did not work, Denver ultimately dealt him to the Kansas City Chiefs, where he instantly became an integral part of the club's dominating defense. In his second pro season, he helped the Chiefs win Super Bowl IV. After six-plus seasons in Kansas City, Culp was traded in 1974 to the Houston Oilers as part of a blockbuster trade. It was, a, it was with Houston that he began to gain personal or perennial acclaim for his consistent high level of play. Almost instantly, Culp helped transform the Oilers from losers to contenders. In his first full season with the Oilers, the team finished with a 10 and 4 record, which was the first winning mark for the club in eight years and just the second in 13 seasons. He was named a one AFL All Star game and five Pro Bowls during his career. Culp also was picked as first team All Pro in 1975 and a second-team selection in 1971, 1977, 1978, 1979. He was selected first or second-team All-AFC five times. As you can tell, Curly Culp had a career well-deserving of a bust here in Keon, Ohio. Jake, back to you, buddy. Thanks, Jerry. So uh, you read off all those accolades, and you talk about having the bronze bust and the gold jacket. For you, you're going on being a Hall of Famer now for just over five years. What has been kind of the, the greatest or coolest moment that you got to experience uh, being a Hall of Famer? Well, the coolest moment is being recognized, uh, being one of the best to play the game. And uh, that is very, uh, very humbling to me. I think that's the main, the main element of it all. All right. I think we'll turn it back over to our, our students there at Maynard High School. <laughs> Any role models or mentors as I was as I was going through uh, as the journey as a teenager? As a teenager um, to be quite honest, I guess I'd have to answer no. Um, my my main mo role models were my parents who did guide me and directed me, and then I had teachers, coaches, and teammates that helped along the way. But I didn't have any teenagers that I can remember that helped me because I was kind of a loner in a lot of respects. As I stated earlier, I, I didn't have a, a lot of social activity because I had a lot of work to do at home, so it wasn't a, wasn't a social bug. Yeah. What about as a player? As a player, absolutely. As a player, uh, you know, in, in uh, Kansas City, I, have, I was one of the younger athletes in the group. We had guys like Buck Buchanan. We had guys like Will O'Neill, who was the first uh, black individual that played middle linebacker for Kansas City. He was there. In fact, he was – he was he, he locker, ne locker next to me in, 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 at training camps and in, in games and what have you. And then Aaron Brown, Aaron Brown uh, played the right end for us. And then Jerry Mays had played the left end. So all those defensive linemen, we were a good, a good a unit. And we have, our, we have our differences, of course. But yet and still, we, we, when it came time to put on that old helmet strap, the chin strap, but we were ready to go. Mr. Culp, throughout your career, whether it be on or off the field, was there a moment that stands out to you that was tougher? Uh, maybe your toughest moment you had to endure throughout your, your football career, either on or off the field? Well, early on in high school, my toughest moment was um, how do I deal with adversity early on? Because I'm an asthmatic and being from Arizona and and the cut grass and the dust and all that, oftentimes I'll have asthma attacks. And I had a, a good a, a coach that understood the fact that I had asthma attacks. And so when it, when it came on, he gave me an opportunity to maybe pull me out of a drill. And, and that was very helpful. Um, and when I, as, I, as I developed and, and, and made it to, to uh, college level, the asthma didn't go away. In fact, I still have asthma. I'm an asthmatic. And so I take medicine daily because of it. So that was one of my main uh, adversities, I guess. And then, um, and then when I was in Houston, being able to work through a little pain, I, both of my thumbs were kind of, I couldn't function with my thumb. My thumbs were broken. OK, 
okay? And so they made a special cast for me so I could play. And rather than grab as defensive linemen do, I started clubbing because I couldn't grab. And then the other, the other thing is, is when I had the, uh, the rib injury where you had the floating rib and, and floating rib. And when you, I know your football players, I know you may, some of you may have had the little ache pain in your rib. And uh, those muscles around that floating rib sometimes when you start to pull, and it hurts a little bit. So working through that, just blocking out that pain, and as I said earlier about courage, working through the pain, and knowing that it was only temporarily, and eventually you, you, you work through it and do the things you need to do for the team to help them win a ball game. So All right. Primarily. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, those things primarily. All right. Okay. Next. Next question. We'll go to the next question there for our, our students in front of you. Uh, yeah. How did you balance work life and family life? In, in football? Oh, yeah, work at family. Um, prioritize. Um, knowing that uh, my day, you know, your day is consisted of certain hours. And so a portion of the time you're going to have to spend practicing and developing your skills. And then, uh, and then when you get home, you try to develop those times where you can spend with your family and develop those relationships as well. I wouldn't know. Sorry, go ahead. So prioritize your, your day, pretty much. All right, we'll go to another question there from, uh, from our students. Uh, in the offseason, did you ever work a different job? I did, I did. Thank. That's a great question. You know, when I was playing football, they weren't, I wasn't making the kind of money that the guys are making now, so it was incumbent upon most of all of the athletes. Uh, we had second jobs. And when I was in Kansas City, I tried a, a few jobs because my first degree was in the field of uh, – business, I had a Bachelor of Science degree from, from Arizona State University, so I wanted to try something out of marketing. So I, so I, gave, I gave insurance an, an option, so I tried to do that one off-season. And then another off-season, I worked in a construction firm where I was a CEO officer, compliance officer, did that for an off-season. And then another off-season, I worked for a company, Union Carbide, where I went on the road, did a lot of coal canvassing, selling batteries throughout throughout the, the state of Oklahoma and Texas and what have you. So I try to do those things mainly to supplement the income that I was receiving for football because you had to to survive. Yeah. You, you mentioned a little bit there, uh, and you have a few times about being from Arizona State. Uh, as we all know, uh, they hired uh, Mr. Herm Edwards as their head football coach uh, for this year. I don't know how close you are with the program now, but – but for coming from a guy who's been in the NFL, even with the Kansas City Chiefs, what, what does a guy like Herm Edwards mean to, to a program like Arizona State? I think it was a great hire uh, from uh, the athletic director, Anderson. In fact, I, I, try, I try to go back um, every year, mainly for a homecoming game. And also due to the fact that I wrestled, I try to get back there maybe once a year to catch in a, a wrestling match. But I think it was a great hire. Kudos to him and the, the development that – that, that the team has shown this year, uh, you know, they made it to a, uh, what is a, a bowl game, which was great. And he's developing a young team. He had three freshmen starting from on defense, I think. And so, and he's developing these, 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 the character of these individuals. And I think that's vitally important. And uh, Herman is a great coach and a great individual. Um, we, we talked a little bit earlier about how uh, you were said to, to revolutionize your position on defense. Uh, do you see anybody today uh, who has kind of taken your playing style and uses it uh, in today's NFL? Um, well, <laughs> I, I don't – I haven't uh, – I mean, there's some great athletes out there, sure enough. In fact, I watch um, – I watch uh, the Texans uh, occasionally, and naturally I watch Kansas City. And they got a guy in Kansas City, uh, I think his name is uh, – what's his name? Chris uh, Brown, I believe, just made all of – just made all pro. He's a great uh, D, uh, D lineman. And so, but J.J. White is good. You know, he's very aggressive. He, you know, became the defensive player of the year, maybe three, three years in a row. So he's a great athlete. So there are a lot of great athletes out there, but just to pick one that I, that I, that I admire or, 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 or say that uh, they're the best at what they do, I, haven't, I don't have that answer for you. All right. We'll send it back over there to, you, to some students for some more questions. But don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. important to That's a great question. Um, I, um, being from Yuma, Arizona, being a, the first of my family to go to college, it was incumbent for me to, to get a degree because I felt that, that a degree would give me uh, options that I wouldn't have otherwise. 
And so that was a very, that was a focus point for me is to get my degree. And, uh, and athletics uh, provided me that opportunity, you know, doing the football, football um, opportunity and scholarship and wrestling. I was went to Arizona State on a football scholarship. But I was able to wrestle as well. Coach Ted Bradyhoff and Frank Cush, being uh, head coach of football, decided that they would allow me to do both sports because that was my interest. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm so grateful that I had an opportunity to, to uh, obtain a Bachelor of Science degree at Arizona State University. If you weren't going to be the, the, have that 14-year career and be a Hall of Famer, did you want to do something? Say your football career didn't work out after Arizona State. What was, uh, what was, was there a job or a career that you were looking into and, and wanted to get into after college? Believe it or not, when I went to Arizona State University, I wanted to be a, a math teacher. But, um, <laughs> and so, but that was kind of side real because when I got to Arizona State, uh, the, the rigorness of, of training and, and everything is that uh, it, it didn't allow me to, to, to stay, on, stay on track to become a math teacher and, and be proficient at it. And so I, I switched my, my degree and went into business. In business, most of that is subject matter. It wasn't like accounting where you learn a principle today and you apply it tomorrow and the following day you learn another principle and it builds up aggressively. So I, I made the change. But, uh, but initially I wanted to be a, a, a professor of mathematics. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. So we'll turn it back over there to some students uh, for some more questions. Regrets and opportunities not taken. <clears throat> well, I, um, I'm very pleased about my life and, and how things have, 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 have developed. You know, being, uh, I'm at the pinnacle of uh, athletic uh, achievement, being a, a Hall of Famer. I'm very pleased with that. And having the opportunity to experience other things in life that I'm very thankful for. So, so all in all, I'm very thankful and blessed. All right, there's another student there who has a question. What significant event in your life do you believe had a huge impact on you? Wow. What significant event that had a huge impact in my life? <coughs> Being born. <laughs> 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 no, I, uh, I, it's, that's a serious question, and, and I should give it the, the seriousness that it deserves. And I should give it the seriousness that it deserves. That's a difficult question, in fact. Um, well, I, I guess what's most significant uh, would be uh, an opportunity to, uh, to go to college, you know, because no one in my family had an opportunity to go to college and, and get a degree. And, and so that would be, I think, the most significant uh, accomplishment in my life initially. Yeah. Uh, yesterday was uh, the early signing day uh, for college football teams throughout the country at all levels. Uh, and we know how important recruiting is. There may be students, student athletes in front of you there today who, who are in the process of being recruited to play their sport at the next level. Can you talk a little bit about the differences you see between how you were recruited to go play there at Arizona State versus how uh, recruits are handled today? Well, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of recruiting today per se, but when I was, when I was recruited, uh, there, was a, a, there was a questionnaire that you had to fill out. I think it was spearheaded by a gentleman in, in Dallas, uh, get his name, uh, but uh, it was a questionnaire you filled out and they tried to determine whether or not you had the right mindset, you know, to uh, play the game of football. Now, I think a lot of it has to do with the combine. When you go to the combine, you have different drills that you have to compete and they use those drills to determine your athleticism of, of, a, particular, of a particular position. And also, they also have an opportunity, the recruits there have an opportunity to talk to you about you know, about you as a person, to get to know you as a person. And so I think that's very helpful in, in the teams being able to draft you, seeing that you have, you have to be a fit. Everybody, you want to make sure that you are fit for an organization, even though you may, you may, you may have uh, certain, you know, athletic skills that are, that are prominent. If they still want to be able to say, well, this guy is going to fit our organization. He's a, he's a, good, he's a good hire, and they'll draft you accordingly. Outside of Arizona State, was there another school that kind of that you may have had your eye on uh, when you went into college? No, I I didn't have my eye on any college. I mean, it was it just kind of happened um, because of my wrestling. Uh, I, I had an offer to to go and and uh, participate at, at UCLA, but the, but the guy, the coach said, "Well, 
you know, you can come out and if you make the team, then you have a scholarship. If you don't make the team, you don't have a scholarship. And I didn't, I didn't particularly care for that kind of uh, arrangement. And so Arizona State was close. I gave me an opportunity to come home on the weekends because both of my parents were up in age and I wanted to be close to them. So it was only maybe a two hours, maybe three hour ride from Yuma, Arizona to Phoenix. So I can always go home to maybe mom would do my laundry or do some at home cooking, you know. But I didn't make that trip too often, but yeah, it was close. All right, is there another student uh, in front of you there, Maynard, that's got a question? Which of your former teammates do you most admire and why? Which of my former teammates do you most admire? Admire. Oh, and why? Well, it's been a while, but uh, when, I, when I think about Kansas City, the person that, that really stands out to my mind is a guy named Bobby Bell. Uh, Bobby Bell played at University of Minnesota and also uh, Buck Buchanan. Buck Buchanan, he passed away at the age of 53 of cancer. And so um, those are, and then Willard Lanier, Jim Marcellus, I guess the whole team, huh? <laughs> uh, but uh, we were a close knit, and uh, and and was very, very. I was very blessed to be in that arena with those individuals. Number one, they were great athletes, and number two, they were great people. And so all of that was helpful for me, being a young man coming in the second year out of out of uh, Arizona State to, to participate in in athletics at a higher level. So for those of you who don't know, Bobby Bell and Willie Lanier are both Hall of Famers, both have a bus just like uh, Mr. Culp does here in Canton. Uh, Mr. Culp, can you tell the students what it's like to come back uh, during Enshrinement Week powered by Johnson Controls to be around 140-plus other Hall of Famers and the kind of close-knit family that, that all of our Hall of Famers are? That is true. It's a close-knit, a, a wonderful man, uh, have an opportunity to talk to people that, that I didn't talk to when I played football, you know, getting to know – their lives and, 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 and what they're doing now and, and trying to, how I say, rekindle those relationships. But it's always important to go back and, and welcome the new class and talk to them and, and, and welcome them to the new family. It's a, great, it's a great bunch of men. Was there a player that you were ever or like starstruck or, or awestruck uh, to see when you were here in Canton, Ohio? Mm. No. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, and, and I'm not saying that in a, in a negative sense. It's just that I didn't, I didn't focus my attention that much on, uh, on, on a specific individual when playing, when playing the game. I focus more on, uh, the, I guess, the overall play of a team and knowing that if I wanted to, to compete, I had to, I had to interact with that team more so than anything else. All right, we're going to turn it back over there to the students in front of you for another question. What were some of the values that your parents taught you? Hard work, discipline, respect, commitment. As I said earlier, you know, um, we had a lot of chores to do before school. So the work ethic, uh, the commitment to make sure that I was pleasing my family doing the things I needed to do to progress as, a, as an individual. Yeah. All right. We'll have uh, another student there at Maynard has got a question. Um, it's not lunchtime yet, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, yes. How much did you sacrifice to become the man you are today? How much did I sacrifice? Wow. I... I guess I talked about the social relationships because uh, although, you know, playing football and being around a great a bunch of men, that that's a, that's a socialization in it of itself, but it's different than being, you know, interacting with your, your classmate, maybe in a math class or a biology class, or, or I was involved in future farmers of America. And so those, those were, were good environments, but it was just a little different setting. And I, I don't think I, I sacrificed that much because I was willing to make those sacrifices and because I wanted to be successful. And, and so in order to be successful, sometimes you have to make a few sacrifices. Yes. And is there another question there in front of you? Uh-oh, lunchtime. 
Uh, if there's no question, I got. I have another question here. We do these programs throughout the entire school year. I uh, talk to 20, 25 Gold Jackets a year, part of the Heart of a Hall of Famer program. Um, and one of the questions we always like to ask is, if you had to pick one, would you pick your Super Bowl ring or would you pick your Hall of Fame ring? Well, that's a difficult question. <laughs> uh, you know, the Super Bowl ring is a ring that I think is more team mm -hmm. because we we're, we were the team, the world champions in 1969, 1970, beating the Minnesota Vikings. So, and then the Hall of Fame ring is more of an individual uh, accomplishment about my body of work. Although going through going through my journey, I did have help from my teammates in order to achieve this ring. I didn't do it by myself. So I think that two both have significance, and I don't know which one I'd pick over the other. I think they're both significant in itself. We Probably we did. We get a different answer for that every time. You have some people, like you said, they said, you know, I, I was a team guy. I uh, We won the Super Bowl together as a team. But then you have other ones that say, you know, the, the third string punter or the 53rd guy on the roster gets a Super Bowl ring too. And to be a Hall of Famer is you're one of 318 of the best to ever play. So definitely can see how, how both sides uh, of the argument there are for you. Uh, we got time here for about uh, probably one or two more questions, so we'll we'll turn it back over to those students there in front of you. Yes. Quit. Want to quit? Well. <laughs> I, you, I, you know, I talked earlier about me being asthmatic and, um, and those, um, those experiences early on. In fact, my, my family doctor, Dr. Phillips, bless his soul, he advised me, said, Curly, he said, you, you shouldn't play. You should play sports because, uh, because of you're an asthmatic. You, you, you wouldn't do well. But uh, that was probably the most significant thing early on that affected me, the, the asthma portion of it. Yeah. Another student have a question? As a fellow defense alignment, I'm even going to Okay, side. congratulations. Are there any, <laughs> any uh, tips you can give me on how, how you can techniques? Oh, techniques. Well, first of all, you have to understand yourself. Understand yourself and what you can do as, as a person and carrying out your responsibilities for the team. You know, if, if, uh, I think the two things are important when you're playing D-line is first of all, you want to get off the ball, right? And you got to get control of your opponent. And so whatever, whatever way that fits you as an individual based on your ability, that's what you should stress. You know, some guys are try to get, you know, up under your pad level. Some guys try to use, you know, your, your arms, leverage and all that. But it just depends on what you can do. And you kind of hone in on those things and use those things to make yourself a better athlete. There another question there from a student at Maynard. Well, this is a quiet group. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. If you didn't achieve your dreams in football, what path would you take it? Well, my dream wasn't to play football. My dream uh, initially was to um, to get an education, get a degree, and then move from that. But, uh, and so I, I had a plan A and a plan B. The plan, I guess my number one plan was to graduate from a college and be able to go out and, 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 and earn my keep, you know, doing that. And just fortunately, I was able to play decent athletically that would give an opportunity to play, you know, pro ball. Yeah. All right, so I got, I got a list of some, we, you know, uh, Jerry read off all those stats uh, that made you a Hall of Famer. I got a list here in front of me. Uh, you inducted to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2013, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame in 2008, 1967 NCAA Wrestling National Champion, uh, a Super Bowl champion, uh, the NFL Defensive Player of the Year in 1975. So you could probably say that you had a, a pretty successful career. Um, what do all those honors mean to you? Well, it means that I had a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh... – well, they're, they're a great, uh, the accomplishments are great, but I think what's, what's more important is the relationships that you build through 
through uh, those various steps in my life, you know, in high school and college and professional football. And I'm so thankful that I were able to, to participate at a, at a great level uh, to help, help my team and myself as I move forward. All right, I think we got time for one more uh, student question there from somebody at, at Maynard. Yes. How did you get past the stress report system? The stress report system? Stress reports, well, I still have stress reports in my life. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, just a realization that uh, there will be times uh, when there are going to be bumps in the road, and you have to, you have to uh, attack them head on. And I think through counseling, uh, if you have a close friend or you have a, if, if you're involved in religion, you have a, have a priest or, or someone that you can talk to to kind of help you through those, those time frames. If you got a, a great family structure, like an older brother, older sister, maybe your parents, maybe your uncle, maybe your aunt, someone that you can go to for guidance in those times to help you through those rough spots. All right, I think we'll wrap it up. I got one more question here for you. I think we'll wrap it up with, if you could leave the students there in front of you and, and everyone we have tuning in here via Facebook Live with one piece of advice or, or maybe one piece of advice you would like to hear uh, as a student their age, what would that uh, piece of advice be? I think the piece of advice would be um, whatever you want to do. And if you want to be great at it, first you have to love it and be willing to sacrifice for it. All right. I, I think that short, simple to the point, I think that's going to, I hope those students go home with that, you know, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. So uh, I think with that, we're going to wrap up this installment, the last one for the year 2018, uh, this Harvard Hall of Famer with Gold Jacket Class of 2013 inductee, uh, Curly Colt. Mr. Colt, I want to thank you, not only from myself, but our youth education department, as well as uh, Joe Horgan, George Varis, our president, David Baker, all the way up there to the top for everything that you've done, uh, not only today during this program, but, but for the game of football. Uh, the, I like to say the game of football wouldn't be like it is today without your influence. So we want to thank you for everything you've done for the game and thank you for everything you've done for us uh, here at the Hall of Fame. So to wrap it up, I think we give Mr. Culp one last round of applause. Thank you. All right, again, I want to thank you, uh, students, for, for participating today, tuning in. Mr. Culp, thank you for being a part uh, of our Heart of a Hall of Famer program, and we hopefully will see, we'll see you back here in Canton next August, and hopefully we'll see all those students here. Right, so thank thanks again. We'll see you, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it.